the thought is that these, if something comes along and it kills all of the non-resistant cells, all the fast cells, then the slow cells can repopulate that population. Whereas if you had no slow cells, the population as a whole would be able to grow a little tiny bit faster um, in the absence of any bad things happening, in the absence of stress. But if some stress coming along, it would kill off the whole population. It would kill off everyone. And then you have zero cells and now you're evolutionarily dead. And dead and, yeah. Biologists want to understand things. They want to understand how cells work. They want to understand why we look and behave the way they do. And we want to understand things too, but we want to do so in, in a quantitative manner that I can write down my predictions for the future and see if they come true or not. If I have a population of a million cells and I give them some drug that kills 99% of them, I want to be able to tell you before giving them the drug which cells will survive and which cells will die. Mm -hmm. if, if we can do that, then we can really understand the system. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Five, four, three, two, one. Ni hao everybody, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. We are still in the beautiful Beijing, China. We are at Peking University School of Life Sciences. We are now gonna be talking about mechanistic prediction in biology. We have Dr. Lucas Carey joining us on the show. Hi, Hi. Lucas. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Love your work. It was so cool getting to know it deeper and hanging out a bit more last night, talking about all our cool ideas and stuff like that. It was great. I'm so pumped for this show. For those who don't know Lucas's background, he's the PI, Principal Investigator of the Carey Lab at Peking University Center for Quantitative Biology. His lab is focused on understanding and predicting how individual cells and populations behave. And you can find his links in the bio below to the Carey Lab, as well as his Twitter profile. All right, Lucas, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I think it, you know, generally it's getting better. It, you know, the rate of change is decreasing these days, I think. But I, I'm confident that uh, this is temporary. I certainly hope that this is temporary um, and that, you know, the relations between China and the U.S. will get better, that, um, yeah, so I'm not worried for the long term. Yeah, that's why we're here. We're here to hopefully open up more uh, friendship and collaboration and global um, cohesion between the U.S., China and the other um, countries in the world. And um, what, what would you say about the rate of change? Because so many people come on the show and they talk about, oh, my gosh, the rate of change is increasing. There's so many exponential technologies unleashing into the world and it's being democratized. So where do you see it actually slowing down? Um, well, I see I see more protectionism coming in. In the U.S. we see this with uh, decreased immigration, with making it more difficult for um, foreigners to get green cards and to convert their PhD that they get in the U.S. into a job and a family in the U.S. I see this also in China that, that um, it's you know, more difficult than it was three years ago, five years ago, to, for foreigners to use like payment systems and rent bicycles and things like this in China. Um, and so this this is I think slowing down. Oh, okay. I think I see. So it's um, like, so there's like a, the ev although the exponential technologies are continuing to boom, there's still some sort of like a a slow down of like, uh, there's some sort of conservatism that yeah, is still yeah. happening at the same time. Yeah. And I think that immigration in all directions is one of the things that gives you technological development, right? A lot of the founders of major companies in the U.S. are immigrants Absolutely. or children of immigrants. And yes. so the, if we want the technological, the rate of technological progress to continue to increase as fast as it has been, the world needs to remain more open, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I was mentioning that so many times now. It's like I can't email some of the Peking University professors because my Gmail or Yahoo emails land in their spam boxes. Mm -hmm. I can't get a WeChat pay or an Alipay here because I don't have a Chinese bank account. I can't link my visa to it. So people look at me like, why are you giving me this archaic cash? Yeah. Scan my <laughs> QR code. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's, it'll be interesting to see how much easier it is. Like it took a long time to get a visa to come to China. Mm -hmm. um, it's a quite a 
t long and tedious and multi-day process. And so you wonder what could be the future of being able to transit between countries safely, mm -hmm. vetted in a vetted way. What could be so easy as to just have money, not need conversions and all this type of stuff. But it's interesting, the cryptocurrency revolution, where that could lead us. And to make it easy for people to be able to cre creatively collaborate across the world. Like if you want founders of the most massive companies in the world to continue for that process, continue happening, making it easier for people to be creative um, is a core yeah. aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Lucas, who were you growing up? It was Woodstock in yeah. New York where you were born. And then you went to Stony Brook. But how did you get interested in genetics and in science when you were a kid? So I don't know the, remember the exact moment, but the sort of the milestone is in fifth grade, I did a genetics project for the science fair where I did uh, crosses of hamsters. And so we ended up with 34 hamsters in, in my house, the offspring of the parents that I was doing the cross with. And my, you know, my hypothesis, so we got more offspring that, that were white than were golden, would look more like the uh, female than the male. And my hypothesis was that they spend more time in their mother and therefore they have more maternal traits. So I was completely wrong. Um, but uh, that was kind of the first memory kind of created by my parents keeping the poster. So <laughs> I don't know how much I really remember and how much I remember from the poster, but definitely I was doing science then, doing genetics then. Cool, cool. And I love hearing about the stories like that. It makes me want to uh, enable more children around the world to have access to science projects like that and mentors that can help them with that because those moments are so pivotal in yeah. picking up what you care about. And also just like 34 hamsters in the house, like the parents. <laughs> yes. being like, yeah, 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 the young scientist. And then now teach us about the trajectory um, to Stony Brook, Brook and through Stony Brook, uh -huh. which is on Long Island, yeah. on the northern part of Long yep. Island. Yeah, 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 cool, yeah. on North Shore. Yeah, so uh, Stony Brook was great. I got there. I had done some research in, in biology and also in computer science um, as an undergraduate. And so I started my PhD and I ended up uh, just kind of hanging out with the guy who was going to become my PhD advisor at the um, first year PhD students like a retreat. This was um, when alcohol restrictions were a little bit looser in the U.S. and the Stony Brook would take all the PhD students out to a hotel in the kind of um, farther east on Long Island and get all the students and professors drunk for the weekend and get some mingling. Uh, and so I thought it was great. Um, and so I started talking to this guy who I had no idea who he was and then ended up doing my PhD with him. So we worked on, on cell cycle control. So. Um, yeast cells and also mammalian cells don't divide into, from one cell into two cells until they've reached some volume. And so they have some way of, a single cell has some way of sensing how big it is. Mm. And we don't know how that is. Like a cell doesn't have a ruler that it kind of puts up. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it measuring exactly? Is it measuring diameter? Is it measuring volume? Is it measuring the amount of protein? And so I spent my PhD trying to work on what do cells actually measure um, to know how big they are. Whoa, and what did you find out? Um, so we found out that, um, found out a couple of things. Um, this was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you, you, sometimes people say that. Like, damn, what was it? <laughs> yeah, uh, so one of the things we found out is that the, so we're basically we're looking for something that's increasing while a cell is growing in size. Um, and you, if you had a ruler, that ruler might remain constant as the cell grows in size. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that remains constant, so yeast cells in particular, and also mammalian cells, this measurement happens before cells replicate their DNA. So while they have just a single copy of their genome in what we call G1 um, before DNA replication. And what remains constant is the amount of DNA. And what increases is the amount of everything else inside the cell as it grows bigger. And so what we found was that the amount of these unstable activators that promote progression into S phase and through the cell cycle, they increase very quickly through this period. Um, but the number of binding sites for them in the genome, of course, remains constant because the DNA replication is not occurring. 
um, and that if we increase the number of binding sites, we delay progression through the cell cycle. If we decrease the number of binding sites, we promote progression through the cell cycle. And so it seems to be this, ba this the, the ruler is kind of the ratio between the number of these promote protein molecules inside the cell and the number of physical binding sites for them in the genome. Whoa. Okay. Okay. So there's a quantitative mechanistic code to the cell when it decides to divide. Yeah. And it has to do with the amount of proteins that are inside of the cell. Yeah. And and then the so binding these sites on the DNA. Yes. Okay. And as those get to a certain threshold, then it can divide. Exactly. So you can imagine there's some constant number of binding sites and then the number of proteins are increasing mm -hmm. and then eventually they reach some kind of ratio threshold Interesting. and then the cell can grow. The can cell can divide and be able to sustain. Yeah. And then, okay, interesting. So that could be then that moment where it's like, okay, there's enough proteins, there's a certain amount of binding sites. What If we divide now, we'll be able to sustain, we'll be able to live and that's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. My goodness, when we were talking about stuff like this last night, we were just going off about how there's just so much quantitative mechanisms in biology and where you are basically like just diving deep into the how these things are actually codified and how we can explain them and gain insights from them. And it's cool that you ended up actually starting to do that so early in your, even in your PhD work. Okay, so then this was cool, the Wiseman Institute in Israel. Mm -hmm. So this is where you did your postdoc. Yeah. Okay, what were you doing there and what is that institute about? Okay, right. so Weizmann is, I think, um, it's a smallish research institute. There's maybe a thousand people or so. It's about 20 minutes outside of Tel Aviv. And it is, in my opinion, it's one of the most creative places for science in the world. So it's a little bit um, outside of mainstream, right? It's a long flight to get there. It's not in Europe. It's not in the U.S. Um, it's a little bit isolated, and it gives it, I think, a sense of freedom. Um, so science there is is very good, very high level, um, but also they like to do things a little bit off the beaten path scientifically. Um, and so there's a lot of really fantastic, really creative scientists there. There isn't the sort of money to do let's sequence a hundred thousand people or this sort of science that is interesting but is just driven by infinite sums of money that there are at some places in the US, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so they asked to say, okay, with plenty of resources, but not those kinds of resources, what is the coolest stuff that we can do? Um, and the, so I was in the computer science department, but I was doing biology. Um, and we were working on the group I was working in uh, of Professor Aaron Segal was working on gene expression. So how many, how does a cell control how many molecules of mRNA, how many molecules of protein are produced? Um, and how is that information encoded in the genome of that cell? Um, so, right, so Eric Lander, who led the human genome sequencing, has this great quote um, about the human genome, bought the book, difficult to read. Uh, and in Aaron's lab, we were trying to understand how, to, how does the cell read the genome. Whoa. Uh, and so in particular, I was working on how, on cell-to-cell -cell variation. Um, so if, if, if we measure a bulk population of a million cells, we can get some average amount of protein per cell that's produced. But, the, but if we look at any one cell, one single cell might have one-tenth of that or ten times that amount. Yeah. Um, and so how, is this cell-to-cell -cell variation also encoded in the DNA? What are the, sequence, the like, sequence features in the DNA that affect the amount of cell-to-cell -cell variation? Okay, so then the cell has a constant query process that it's running to its mechanistic parts and it's always knowing what amount of these different parts of the cell that I have, how many mitochondria I have or how much um, ribosomes I have, blah, blah, proteins mm -hmm. I have. And then, so the cell kind of has like a ledger in a sense and it's constantly updating its like ledger and then there's moments where the the amount of 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 uh, 
of proteins in uh, okay fine in a in a uh, in a large in a large amount of, of cells the average mm -hmm. will be uh, pretty just like on in, in in the human race the average will be um, a specific given average but when you look at one cell it could be one tenth of that average in terms of the amount of proteins it has versus exactly. 10 times the amount of proteins in the individual ones. So just like with maybe overall on the planet, we could have maybe a specific amount of wealth mm. on the planet in total in the sum, but then one person could have like 3% of the total yeah. wealth and another person could have 0.000001% of the total yeah. wealth. So yeah, okay. Exactly. And wealth is a, is a nice example, right? So we don't look at the mean, the average, when we think about wealth because it's so influenced by the top 0.01% of the population. So that really increases the value of mean income, for example. Um, we look at the median when we think about wealth of, of countries, wealth of people. Um, and similarly in, in cells, the average can sometimes not even exist. So there are cases where you have a population of cells that have lots of some protein, a population of cells that have very little amount of this protein, you take the average, that's in the middle, but there are no cells that are in the middle. They only are all on or all off. And so sometimes the average is completely misleading value. Whoa. So either they'll have a lot of the proteins or a little bit of the yeah. proteins, but there's not really a lot in the middle. Yeah, so there's cases like this that exist. And of course, if you were to take a population level average, you would get a value that's in the middle, even though there are no cells like that. Whoa. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. And this was the main project when you were yeah, in Israel. A, yeah. This was the main one. Do you think that that ledger analogy is a decent way to look at it? Like the cell keeps a ledger of its parts. I think for some proteins, yes. It's going to be a dynamic ledger. The cell is basically going to be constantly checking: Do I have enough of this? Do I have too much of this? Mm. And then modifying gene expression, modifying other things if something becomes too much or too little. For other things, I think the cell doesn't care so much. What, <laughs> other, thi what other things do you think it doesn't care so much? Um, there's quite a lot of proteins in a cell. So different proteins, one thing we found in, in Israel is that different proteins have very different amounts of variability. Some proteins have lots of variability, other proteins have very little variability. And this amount of variability is encoded in DNA. So evolution has selected to say, okay, this gene, I really care how much there's going to be. And I'm going to kind of keep track of how much there is and to very tightly regulate it. And when I'm making it, I'm going to make always exactly the same amount. And other proteins, whether you have 10 times too much or 10 times too little, the cell doesn't really seem to care so much, at least in the experiments that we can do in lab. It may be that there's some environmental condition where the cell really does care, or our experiments are not sensitive enough to pick up the cell's caring, but certainly the cell doesn't care that much. So it could even be that the cell has a ledger of its own internal mechanistic parts, but also its environment that it's in. So yeah. it's constantly dynamically adjusting the ledger and then expressing genetically to yes, dynamically adjust. Yes. Interesting. The cell definitely cares about its environment. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, the ledger internally and the ledger externally. Kind of like we have one too, like we're like, okay, my ledger for my stomach is I haven't eaten yet today, mm. you know? But my like ledger for my outside world is like, it's whatever, it's like 2.30 p.m. right now mm. and it's a little sunny out, you know? So yeah. it's like not, it's not raining, you know, which is, so these are like different environmental ledgers. So I wouldn't need to bring an umbrella today, mm. you know? So it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there was, a, there was a quote from, from when we were uh, hanging out uh, yesterday where I, I said something along the lines of like, um, when we were hanging out, it was like, like Lucas goes, Alan, this is how biology works. And then I go, well, Lucas, is it possible that civilization works in a similar <laughs> way? And, and so it was great when you were like, yeah, maybe, or maybe not like that, quite like that. And so there was just this, constant process of trying to find relatable analogies or metaphors or storytelling methodologies that could then get other people around the world to better understand uh, biology. Mm -hmm. 
It's so important to be a good communicator. Um, okay, so then how about um, post uh, Israel, how did you accept this position in Barcelona to be a PI and a professor? Mm -hmm. and that was for five years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I went to Barcelona. I'd never been to Barcelona before, but I liked, I lived in Tel Aviv during my postdoc. I liked this kind of Mediterranean lifestyle. <laughs> Tel Aviv is a fun city. Um, yeah. And I went to Barcelona. My office looked out onto the Mediterranean. I went swimming during a lunch break during my interview. Yeah. Um, and then I went back to the city for a week or so to check it out and I said I could live here and the science was very good also of course mm -hmm. um, but the city is, is fantastic um, yeah. yeah I love how your pitching <laughs> points are like yeah, the Mediterranean the city <laughs> the life the science I love that um, okay and then so then what did you end up you know signing on to investigate all right, um, so when we, in my postdoc, we worked on cell to cell variable and gene expression. And at the end of my postdoc, I guess um, we were still doing experiments on this, but I was, we were trying to think, me, when I say we, me and, and a friend of mine who's now a professor at Yale, David Van Dyke, he was in the same lab as me, we worked together. Uh, and we were trying to think, okay, like what is more exciting than gene expression? What is, where is their cell to cell variability? Where is it interesting? But where is their field that people don't really know so much about? Because people know a lot about, cell to, uh, about gene expression. It's been worked on for a long time. And so we thought, uh, well, what about growth and proliferation? Mm -hmm. So cell, uh, what cell, cell division, division after division after division. So not so much the length of time it takes one cell to divide, but the, the rate of growth of a whole population of cells. And if we look at single cells, we see that some of them are proliferating very rapidly. And other cells in the same population that have the same DNA sequence and are in the same environment, are right next to each other, are growing much more slowly. And so we said, okay, well, there's lots of cell to cell variability there um, and noise there. Let's try and figure out what's happening here. And we, we didn't know anything. Um, so the first thing we did in Barcelona um, was we developed some techniques to measure cell to cell variability and proliferation and to understand how this relates to gene expression. So we developed some techniques to get the slow proliferating cells from a population and also the fast proliferating cells from a population. And then we could do RNA sequencing on these cells and other sorts of experiments because we were able to grab the slow and fast proliferating cells and to physically separate them from this, a single population. Um, and so this led us kind of better and just generally understand what's going on in the system. Um, and then I spent most of the rest of the time in Barcelona tr trying to understand where this cell to cell variability in growth comes from um, and also what are the consequences for the cells. Whoa, okay, in proliferation, you also see great variability. Some cells are proliferating quite healthily and rapidly and others are much more slowly. And so then it's okay, let's take a single cell from both of those, a faster growing and slower growing, and yeah. then sequence the RNA. Yeah. Okay, and when you found, uh, when you did the RNA sequencing, what were the findings? Mm -hmm. um, so we found a couple of things that were sort of expected and some unexpected things, which I think is always good, right? We know something about biology and so, you should always be able to find something that you look back on and say, oh, this makes sense. Uh, so we found that fast growing cells need to make more proteins, which totally makes sense, right? That if, you're, if you're growing more quickly, you need to be producing more cell, producing more biomass. And so fast growing cells have more genes for producing more biomass, for producing more cells. Um, slow growing cells seem to be very stressed. Um, they we're expressing more genes, different types of genes, just kind of expressing more stuff from their genome. Um, and so it seemed to be sort of maybe diversifying themselves a little bit. Like, and at that point, we weren't really sure whether it was every single cell becoming diverse or whether our slow cells are a, a population of individual cells. Um, and we're still not really sure. Each, so you've got two possibilities. One possibility is that every cell is diversified as much as it possibly can be. And the other possibility is that you've got this population of slow cells that look diverse from a population level, but at the individual level, you would see that 
one cell is doing task A, another cell doing task B, a third cell doing task C, and you're kind of mixing them all together. And it looks diverse from there. But certainly that slow growing population is much more diverse and much more stressed, uh, but also much more stress resistant than the fast growing population. Okay, so 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 so, so faster growing is um, more stress resistant is less, less stress, less stress resistant. resistant. Yeah. Slower growing is more stress resistant. Yeah. Okay, so you're more vulnerable if you're growing faster. Yes, you're much more vulnerable if you're growing faster. Okay, and then within the uh, faster growing, you saw that with the RNA sequencing that there was a higher production of proteins. Yeah. And that was a pretty given, like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. And then you also saw that in specifically the faster growing, or maybe in maybe it was just in the faster growing, but that you if you if you saw the whole uh, proliferation, the whole culture, that there was a, a just this, the, the 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 organism was going in a specific direction. But then when you went and took individual cells out, you could maybe see that there was like a type A or a type yeah, B exactly. execution process it was focused on. Yeah, and especially for the slow growing population. Oh, especially in the slow growing yeah. population. We think that in the fast population, there's less diversity. The cells are probably just kind of maximizing their growth rate. There's one major way to do that, and all the cells are growing as fast as they possibly can to do this. And in the slow growing population, we see that there's more different types of cells. There are kind of different types of slow growing cells. Um, and some of these are resistant to, um, to heat, for example, um, but um, where some of them are resistant to drugs, to antifungal drugs, but they're sensitive to heat. Um, and so maybe that, so there's this idea of bet hedging that there's th that uh, the population as a whole wants to grow very fast. It does this by having individual cells that are growing very fast. But if some stress comes along, it will kill the fast growing cells because they're very sensitive to, to stress. They're very easy to kill. Um, and in the slow growing cells, you can imagine two strategies. One would be to have some slow growing cells that are resistant to everything that could come along. But maybe this is difficult or impossible the, by the way the cells are wired. And so what we, what we see is that there's different types of slow cells and some of them will be resistant to some things and, uh, and res others resistant to other things. Um, and the, the thought is that these, if something comes along and it kills all of the non-resistant cells, all the fast cells, then the slow cells can repopulate that population. Whereas if you had no slow cells, the population as a whole would be able to grow a little tiny bit faster um, in the absence of any bad things happening, in the absence of stress. But if some stress coming along, it would kill off the whole population. It would kill off everyone. And then you have zero cells, and now you're evolutionarily dead end. Dead end, yeah. This one was really interesting when we were diving into it yesterday, this idea of bet hedging. And this is quite a bit of what you're doing now at the Carey Lab? Uh, yeah. Analysis of yeah. this proliferation and bet hedging and uh, yeah. single cell RNA sequencing, stuff like that. Yeah. OK. And so. You were doing quite a bit of this in Barcelona. Yeah. Then, okay, cool, cool. Okay, so, all right. So, in the uh, the slower growing population, the let's let's actually go to the faster growing population is more vulnerable to uh, to to death uh, from. Uh, some sort of an environmental uh, stimuli, like maybe the, a drug, like an, an antibiotic. Yes. Meanwhile, that's trying to grow in our, um, the bacteria is trying to grow in our, um, in our body. And so then uh, it's more vulnerable because it's proliferating faster and faster. And uh, it may not have the hedged bets placed on some of its, um, uh, even a very small population within it that is um, able to be 
uh, antibiotic resistant. Yeah. Whereas in maybe the small population, there's uh, uh, that, that uh, there has been uh, a bet that's been, uh, you're, you're doing some bet hedging in the smaller population where there are at least a percentage of the cells that are uh, expressing themselves in a way that is not quick proliferation, but is at least saying we're gonna be uh, drug resistant so that uh, we can make sure that we evolutionary stay alive longer. Yeah. Gosh, that part is so nuts. Okay, and then now let's go back to that first part. So in the small population, uh, you see more like type A, type B, type C, type D, like. Yeah. And maybe in a sense we could compare this to um, like how someone is uh, uh, right now like uh, like literally bringing watermelons onto campus at PKU and mm -hmm. then like and then they're like you know cutting the watermelons and giving it to the students that, that are paying for it and stuff mm -hmm. that's like type A and type B is like a PI okay but like this is in the population of the planet like humans okay so then one node is growing watermelon and selling watermelon to students one node is doing some cutting edge biological research so like different nodes, cell types are expressing themselves in different ways. There's like thousands of PIs across the planet. Mm. There's like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of farmers around the planet. Mm. So there's maybe a little bit more of the type of cell that is a farmer than there is a PI cell type. I have to think more about this. <laughs> yeah, a the, bit. These like sociological <laughs> comparisons are so interesting. I, I can, we talked a little bit about as, uh, this comparison with like uh, investment portfolio. This is a good one, yeah. That, for the hedging. This yeah, is for hedging, yeah. That you, um, there's, you, you know, the simplest thing would be to invest in, you know, index fund tracking S&P or something like this. And this will do reasonably well, but in an economic downturn, you're screwed. And so maybe you want to put aside a little bit of money into, a, into something that's counter-cyclical that will, that will um, you know, that won't, well, you won't lose all your funding if the economy crashes. Um, and there are many different things that won't lose all their money if the economy crashes. So you could put a little bit into shorting the housing market and a little bit into some bonds in J Japan or something like this that's relatively stable. Um, and so none of these will grow as fast, um, but they won't lose all their value mm. in the case of a disaster. Mm. Yeah, this diversified portfolio analogy is really interesting. Everyone and their mother is pouring money into real estate, mm -hmm. and that's like the fast proliferating. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and then all these other um, types are then uh, maybe in the slower uh, proliferation are uh, bonds or um, the different types of slower growth um, diversified aspects of the portfolio yeah. so that if there is a big economic downturn for real estate that you don't just go to zero so yeah. you have bet hedging being done even in cells in cell populations there's bet hedging yeah. being done Crazy. so the other alternative and there's not really good evidence for one or the other is that cells simply can't all grow this fast and they're growing as fast as they possibly can and they're growing so fast that they have some chance of you know, tripping and falling. Like if you were running hurdles as fast as you could, and there would be some threshold where you might gain a little bit of speed, but you increase the chance of you tripping over a hurdle. Like increase the chance of a poor mutation maybe? Either or a mutation or something going wrong biochemically, like mm. building up too much of of something because some component inside the cell that becomes toxic because you don't have the ability to get rid of it fast enough or we're not really sure. Interesting, um, yeah. But this is, we also have... And that's called autophagy when it, the cell gets rid of the component that is... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you could do, you could grow so fast, like a like a hurdler that's running, that they trip over the hurdle, like a cell would be proliferating so fast that some biochemistry goes wrong, and it's um, a auto autophological process. Uh, there, it's an mm. autophagy process ends up failing, yeah. and then there's a uh oh moment, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And now we're going slow. Yeah. And yeah, so this yeah. is sort of the evolutionary neutral point of view. This hasn't, in this point of view. 
this slow growing state has not evolved to be such. It just is a consequence of the cell trying to grow as fast as it possibly can. And it could be both of the things that you yes. described. Yeah, okay. Interesting. Okay, and those two things again are uh, just in, like, if you're growing too fast, and I, like, I like the hurdling analogy. So it's like mm. you, you could be growing too fast and you could trip, so you want to prevent um, that. That could be one of the, these quantitative mechanistic biological components of cell proliferation mm -hmm. um, is uh, hedging against that. And then, it, and then the other one is that uh, you want to diversify this portfolio um, for all different types of environmental um, potential yeah. malevolence and yeah interesting and you can imagine a situation like where it only matters if you get gold silver or bronze and so you want to run as fast as you can because coming in fourth versus tripping and coming in last are the same ah wow okay okay wow yeah, if that's the if that's the case, then uh, that adds a whole new layer of complexity. If only first to third place matter, and fourth is the same as tripping and falling and placing zero third last, because then you would want to put as much of your logic towards quantitatively proliferating, putting the mechanisms for proliferation. Pr prioritize that. Put the, yeah. Get, put the foot on as much of the gas as possible. Yeah. Because we want first, second, or third. Yeah. It's kind of in a sense it's uh, maybe it's somewhat similar and somewhat different in our like like in our sociological hierarchies because we uh, in, in the sense of in the entire eight billion hierarchy, let's say of wealth that if you come in fourth, you're still doing ridiculously well. Mm -hmm. um, so you might uh, want to just put your foot on the gas, but uh, yeah, play some, uh, you might hedge, hedge some bets and stuff. But if you're, maybe if you're only in a group of like, like, uh, like 10, PIs uh, in a in a in a, um, in a in a in a life sciences department at a university, um, then uh, you know placing fourth isn't so much on the grid. It's mm. it's it, it didn't land so like placing fourth is like okay well they're the fourth best PI out of ten at like a life sciences you know department. So uh, versus being fourth in like this whole the wealth hierarchy, interesting. Just always trying to find these yeah. sociological. Analogies. Okay, and then I'm wondering. Yeah, go ahead. Thinking about this, um, if it's somewhat similar to the way that the tech industry is working now, where you burn through insane amounts of cash to become first in in your market. That's right. And it doesn't matter if you're. There's no difference between zeroth place and you know the fourth biggest, you know, e-commerce platform in a market. Nobody's buying from them. Yeah. Everyone's buying from Alibaba and Amazon. No one even knows who's the second most. <laughs> like eBay. Like, you know. Yeah. You definitely don't know the who's third. The third, <laughs> third <laughs> the fourth <laughs> biggest e commerce platform. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And you don't know the third uh, rideshare company either. You know Didi in yeah. China, and you know Uber and Lyft mm. in the US. Yeah and other places in the world, but that's it. Yeah. Uh, so we only remember one, two, and maybe <laughs> three, maybe. So fourth is almost, yeah, the same then, in a sense as, wow. So that's why it's uh, pour as many resources onto the fire of the tech company's growth as possible. Yeah. What an interesting analogy. So we have some, uh, some of our uh, economical uh, processes that, some of our quantitative mechanistic biological <laughs> processes related to economical growth are actually somewhat similar to the way that cells proliferate. I think that's fair to say. You get the same sort of exponential benefits. So. If, uh, pop if two populations are growing exponentially, so the, the bigger they are, the faster they increase, um, then 
a very small difference in initial growth rates gives you very large you know, advantage towards the end. And this is why tech companies blow through all this money to become first in their market, is because of the thought is that once they have kind of this dominant, dominant place, this gives them advantages that are not available to second, third, fourth place. Okay, so when you were teaching me about this, you were saying it from a perspective of the, the predictability of evolution and at least to have a better version of understanding and making that more quantitative. So what exactly can we say about the, like predicting the, the fates of single cells and of organisms and like why are you so passionate about mm. understanding the codified processes of that? Okay. Um, so we, I use predict because if I say, if I told you I understood something, you would basically just have to take my word for it. But if I tell you I can predict something, I can write down my prediction and you can test me on that. And you can see, okay, can you predict this? Uh, and so biologists want to understand things. They want to understand how cells work. They want to understand why we look and behave the way they do. Um, and we want to understand things too, but we want to do so in, in a quantitative manner that I can write down my predictions for the future and see if they come true or not. And so I, w I want to, if I have a population of a million cells and I give them some drug that kills 99% of them, I want to be able to tell you before giving them the drug which cells will survive and which cells will die. Mm -hmm. if, if we can do that, then we can really understand the system. And there might be some complete randomness in this factor. So I might be able to tell you this cell has a 90% chance of survival and this cell has a 10% chance of survival. That might be the best I can do if I knew all information. Um, but we're now very far from being able to do that. Um, and so this is what we're really interested in doing. Can we, can we predict which cells will survive um, a drug treatment? Can we predict which cancer cells will survive chemotherapy, this sort of thing? Um, and then can we predict uh, we know that in, in hospital settings, for example, cells tend to evolve antibiotic resistance very quickly. Also inside of patients, cells tend to evolve antibiotic resistance, and especially antifungal resistance, uh, pathogenic fungi evolve antifungal resistance. Cancer cells evolve get chemotherapy resistance very reproducibly. Um, but sometimes they don't. And in the lab we can do experiments, and we see that some types of cells are able to evolve this drug resistance very rapidly and very reproducibly, and other cells just don't, or do so much more slowly. Uh, and so this cell tells us that evolution should be predictable, that we should be able to predict kind of which cells are more easy to evolve than other cells. Mm. And that this information is somehow encoded in the cell and probably encoded in the DNA of the mm -hmm. cell. Um, and I, so I see, I want to say I see, especially with the um, um, the, the oncological the benefits here of doing your experiments in the lab is that um, so many of us have uh, parents or grandparents that are literally going through processes of cancer mm -hmm. um, and de their health deteriorating from that. And if we can do this science faster, we can understand and more effectively build better tools for it. We can understand then there are specific uh, genetics encoded within s t cancerous cells that enable them to fight better uh, our treatments than other ones that just seem to uh, die off from our from our treatments so we want to now what would we do that would be optimal would we want to uh, f figure out how to compete against the the uh, the, the, the cancerous cells that have a, a stronger robustness um, towards a fighting against our treatments? So it's a good question. Uh, so one, one thing we've thought about doing with the bacteria is are there non-toxic things you could give the cells that would interfere with their ability to evolve or would interfere with their ability to be in this resistant state? Um, so these are kind of non-obvious treatments that you wouldn't normally you think, okay, well, maybe if I give two different drugs, then that'll kill the cells better. And indeed, that, that usually does work. But cells can evolve resistance to this also. Um, but, um, and, but if we could put the cell in a state where it was less evolvable, or, it, or we could put the population of cells into a state where there are fewer of these 
resistant cells. And that might even be making, by making them grow faster. Right? Because as I said, can't, cells that are growing fast are more sensitive to stresses and to drugs. And so if we could get rid of the non-growing tumor cells by making, more, by making them grow, and of course this would be very risky, yeah. but if we could make all of the cancer cells grow, then all the cancer cells could be killed by chemotherapy. A one-two punch of sorts where you give them this little uh, uh, artificial boost and you make them think, aha, we got it, and then you come in with the second hit and you're like, aha, you thought because you were growing, proliferating faster, you became more sensitive, vulnerable, and now we really wiped you out. Exactly. So you move, you move them from slow proliferation state to a fast proliferation state, and then you wipe them out. Yeah. You trick them. That's one option. Yeah. Okay. And the, the other option for this, um, ev this evolution of drug resistance, um, here you give the cells the drug, and it kills most of the cells, but some of the cells have some mutations and they're able to gain more mutations and evolve drug resistance. Um, if we, you can only give a, and right now we don't know, you know, if we have a choice of a couple of different treatments for a tumor or for an infection, we give one that the cells are sensitive to, and end of story, and we hope that it kills all the cells. If we could predict, hey, this infection is going to evolve resistance to drug A, but it's not going to evolve resistance to drug B. If we could predict evolution, and if these evolutionary paths were different enough, then we could give treatment based on the predicted future of the infection or of the cancer, instead of just based on the current state. As in, there is a... Uh you could map the cancer's future trajectory and then give a uh, treatment based on where it's going yeah. instead of its current state. So if you think about climate change, we're not worried about climate change because of this one degree temperature rise. We're worried because of the future predictions of climate change, yes. which we're quite confident in. And we're less interested in uh, telling people to burn less fossil fuels or more interested in being like let's obsolete all of the old technology with this mm -hmm. new more efficient more effective cleaner yeah. more sustainable technology but all of this is based on predictions of the future and not so much what is the current state of the earth yeah so we as future prediction machines are thinking about our grandkids and the planet that they inherit. Mm. And that's why we're caring so much. And there's actually an indigenous principle called the seventh generation principle. So no, literally them thinking prior to acting mm. anything. Okay. How is this going to affect seven generations out? Prediction is hard that far in advance. But I think it's also, you're right, it is very hard that far in advance, but it also can teach us something with, uh, it's not just I'm going to fish here or I'm going to harvest this or I'm going to burn this fossil fuel because it is not, uh, that's a very uh, immediate, we, it's like overly reliant on immediacy. Uh, and we've developed a cortex that enables us to do something like think about a seventh generation and be like, if I fish here, what happens next generation? If I harvest this, what happens next generation? How do I replenish the soil or replenish the fishery or produce a more sustainable way of producing energy for my mm -hmm. town? Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. So then the ledger, the dynamic ledger of a cancer cell is also understanding its internal processes, understanding its uh, exterior environments, and also trying to um, predict some sort of future where it can basically take over that organism potentially. Whoa. This is hard stuff. Yeah. yeah. So there's a big open question in, in biology of like, can cells evolve evolvability? Can you, 
can a cell have selected for the ability to change in the future? Um, I'm tempted to say no. Can cells evolve evolvability? Yeah. Because, right, so for a cancer cell, its current state is, okay, I need to grow as fast as I can. Or for a po for population, for any organism, it wants to grow as much as it can. Um, maybe it, we're kind of complicated enough to realize that, well, if I grow as fast as I possibly can, then my grandchildren are screwed. But microbes are not, certainly. Um, or we would at least think that. Maybe, maybe they are, and that's why they do this bad hedging. Who knows? Mm. Um, but now you're asking, can, they, can a cell have evolved so that it can more easily change its genome in the future in response to something or to allow it to grow in some new environment? Um, and that I'm hesitant to say that yeah. organisms can do that. Yeah. Interesting. We can certainly design them to be like that. Yeah. This is this like designer organism idea. Could we make the proliferation populations more uh, prediction machines about the future, more evolvable, to hmm. have them develop evolvability more. Hmm. So maybe that, and maybe that has to do with running so many different engineering, so many different simulations of the proliferation for them to build more resistance to all of the different environmental stimuli we throw at them, and then they encode those better and better. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Yeah, this is really biotechnology, which, uh, and as we become designers of the biology, is a, it's a whole new opening up of potentials. What about, you gave us the uh, oncological assistance. Mm -hmm. This work in the lab can help with that. Where else do you think the work in the lab can help with? Mm, um... So with infectious diseases, which I would sort of put in the same category as cancer, mm -hmm. um, in the sense that we do some treatments, we have fungi that infect uh, rice and wheat and things like this, and you give them, you spray antifungals onto the field and they just become resistant. Mm. Um, and same thing, viruses that are killing some crops. Um, so all these sort of fall into this general class of single cells that are growing kind of as fast as they can and they're trying to grow and we're trying to kill them. Well, and then what would a farmer do for a crop, rice, wheat, mm -hmm. that is currently has the solution of just spraying antifungal but then obviously they develop the, the, co the counter, the yeah. properties that counter that antifungal spray. So how would your lab produce uh, the solution? Mm -hmm. so, so here I think that if we could predict which strains, which pathogenic strains, which can, um, will evolve resistance to which drugs, um, we could say, okay, spray fungicide A, but not fungicide B because this particular genotype will evolve resistance to A more, much more easily than resistance to B. Um, even though the initial killing will be the same, um, the evolutionary kind of paths will be different. Um, this, I think, would be really cool to be able to mm -hmm. do. And is there an even more, maybe, golden key solution to it where there could be a process of engineering the genomes of the rice or the wheat to be just super duper uh, combative to all of the different uh, f fungicides? Or, yeah. And f f well, yeah. This, is, this is sort of how the BT um, from Monsanto works, or BT corn, BT soy. If you have crops that express their own toxins, 
these end up being much more effective. If I spray fungicide on the field, I'm spraying the workers on that field, I'm spraying the soil, I'm spraying the air, and I'm spraying the rivers around it. But if the crops produce that toxin, it's much more targeted mm -hmm. to the fungi that are growing on the toxin. Um, and you can have the crops produce very toxic things. So plants are nice in that they're not human, right? So things that are very toxic to plants and very toxic to, um, to plant pathogens can be completely non-toxic to mammals. And we would just have, need to have some sort of like longitudinal tests of like... Is it really non-toxic? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if we engineer the rice or engineer the corn or wheat that to com combat against the, um, the in infectious toxins more yeah. than would to compete they could, could, and also to combat against uh, pesticides and against uh, uh, drought and mm -hmm. all these types of things. Or maybe just ma yeah, make them grow uh, in different conditions. So, so all this type of stuff. The question would be then, if I eat that for 20 years, am I still good? Mm -hmm. And uh, we would just need to do the longitudinal test to do so. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then um, let's talk about how like overall this field as exponential technology continues to increase and our computational capacity continues to increase, our microscopy increases, all these types of things are kind of like coming together, sequencing abilities, all these types of things coming together. Do you see us unlocking some sort of basic source code of cells and biology in general? Um, I think we're getting much better. So we have the source code. Um, right? We have the genomes. That's, e that's the easy part. Um, it's reading the source code. You know, the source code is all assembly from, uh, I don't know, an old IBM mainframe or something like that. It's very difficult to read. Um, it's source code that has been worked on by you know, programmers over the past uh, you know, million, hundreds of millions yeah. of years. Yeah. Uh, so it's a complete mess. There's no comments anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> There's no comments. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're getting much better at reading it, that's for sure. There's no repositories of like the older builds. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We can go back, well, we can go back 10,000 years, right? We can get resurrect ancient DNA from about 10,000 years ago. Um, but that doesn't do us nearly good enough, right? We, yeah. If, so, okay, so source code is there with the DNA. Yeah. Okay. And then it's specific short sequences of DNA create amino acids, with amino acids which then create proteins. Mm -hmm. And so that part we're, st we're still figuring out as well, which sequences create which amino acids, which create which so proteins. that we've got. It's all more... Of it? All of it? Too? Pretty much, yeah. I'd wow. say all of it. Um, and how many uh, total proteins are made by, like, uh, our... 25,000? 25,000. Depends on which you count, but 25,000. And we have that all down. Yeah. The question is, how does the cell control and how does our body control these? So how does the cell... Tell cell tell you cells to become eye cells and to become no cells and this sort of thing and yeah. how does the cell know how much you know how much melatonin to produce to create a pigment or how much hair to produce or whatever so these kind of quantitative things of how much of this gene how should I make how much of this protein should I make that we're still working on yeah melanin for yeah, sorry. skin tone yeah, melanin. and melatonin for sleeping yes. so and both. and then uh, digestion too like if you you know how do you, you know when the cell regulates to produce digestion abilities when you eat food and yeah. that type of stuff it's like yeah the pigment of the color of your eyes blah 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 there's so yeah. many things why is there no hair on your forehead yeah. so all this is encoded <laughs> in DNA and this we have no idea so somewhere in that DNA is the statement, no hair on foreheads Yes. yes for yes. most people. Yes. Sometimes that goes wrong and you do get hair on foreheads. foreheads. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we have no idea where that information is in the genome. Okay. Source code, uh, how that produces amino acids and proteins, got it. Mm. How the cell decides when to call forth that building block of amino acid to gene expression, amino acid to uh, protein mm -hmm. is like, hmm, figuring out. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, okay. And then do you then think that it's possible for us to figure out how the cell keeps that dynamic ledger of its internal state, of its external state, of its like future possibilities? Yeah. I do. Um, I think that we can do this in simple cell systems. We can do this in engineered systems that we've, so if we take a system and we design it and then we make changes, we're pretty good now at predicting the outcomes of those changes. If we take, one thing that we do in my group is we will design, for example, a million different variants of a single protein. Um, and then use all that data to, to understand what is the effect and to predict what is the effect of individual mutations and of groups of mutations on function. So once we have a million data points, if I make a new mutation, the million first data point, I can use those previous million to predict pretty well um, what the outcome of that m new mutation is going to be, even though I haven't measured it yet. Um, and I think eventually we'll get there with humans. I think it will take much longer. Humans are complicated. Um, but right, the ultimate goal is if I, I should be able to take a new patient and say, okay, this patient has the following thousand mutations in them relative to the population as a whole. What is the impact of each of these mutations on their health? Um, and we're moving there slowly. I'm confident that we'll get there yeah. eventually. Yeah. Okay, given the rapid pace of exponential technology and democratization of the tools and our ability to probe with the science that we think that we could basically have a better understanding of the ledger of biology and all of the quantitative mechanisms of biology to the point where it could be that um, when you come in for, you don't even need to come in, you just have a constant stream of your biometrics being processed and that you can uh, and that's literally being pa pattern recognition on that compared to our vast library of other patterns that have been recognized. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, okay, Lucas, you're, we're starting to de detect a specific pattern with your biometrics where um, it's going to be important for you to get eight hours of sleep tonight or mm -hmm. to yeah, go exercise or to eat a, a healthier meal or whatever to make sure you don't have some sort of dysfunctional um, pathology that develops or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Yes. Oof. Okay. It also has been hypothesized that this is like a $100 trillion industry over the next like 100 years that biotech and all of its components because you were giving the examples in healthcare but then there's examples in agriculture and the examples in energy and there's just like that's already extremely insanely massive fields and given the amounts of big data that are being crunched by computation and all this stuff like there can be some serious big booming companies and like get creating in that space that's a big space get researching in that mm -hmm. space forming companies so. yeah yeah Okay, a couple quick questions on the way out. Um, how can we inspire more people around our world to work together? I think making it easier to work together. Um, scientists certainly want to collaborate. Um, and also, I think many scientists enjoy traveling to different places um, yeah. and sort of using collaboration as an excuse to go on vacation and check out new cultures, new places. Um, but I, I think regulations tend to make it hard, right? Um, you weren't able to, you know, you use the awesome payment systems that we have access to in China because you don't have a national ID number yeah. and you don't have a bank account. Um, and likewise, there are issues and similar issues when people visit the U.S. Yeah. Um, so this, I think, makes it more difficult. Um, yeah, it's just increasing mobility. Yeah. Doesn't have to use be permanent freedom. mobility, but just even temporary mobility. Temporary mobility. And Making it easier for PhD students who go to the US to go home to visit their families. Um, yeah, yeah. And making it easier for PhD students who want to come to China. It's really difficult for foreign PhD students to come to China. Interesting. Degrees of freedom, degrees of mobility, even if temporary, just making it so that you can vet people and through a trusted process more effectively and 
get, increase global collaboration and uh, creativity through that. Going into this exponential technology age, you have a young son as well. What do you think uh, young kids should do, should learn that's a skill that's gonna just be enabling them to be equipped really well? I think just general problem solving as kind of in an abstract sense. Like, I, if, you, if you know how to solve abstract problems that have undefined solutions, where, where it's not clear how to solve this, then you can learn programming if you need to. You can learn to interface with politicians if you need to. You can kind of learn all the specific things uh, later. But if all you've done throughout your life is solve problems that have defined steps to ending up at a predetermined solution where you already maybe know the answer, um, then you're in trouble once you get to the first task where there is no clear answer or it's not clear how to get there. And I see this as a problem in, in my education and in the education system here. I remember in our labs in physics and undergraduate we're solving all these problems and doing these experiments where we know the answer already. We're measuring G, the gravitational constant. But we already know the answer. We know how the experiment worked out. Uh, and I don't think that these are inspiring. And I also don't think that they teach you to do proper problem solving. Yeah, yeah. Here are the 17 sustainable development goals. Figure out how to solve them. Exactly. Yeah, stuff like that. I love that. Yeah. Okay, how about what is the ultimate nature of this reality? Why are we here? What is the meaning of this, the teleology of the species? I don't think there's any inherent meaning for being here. I don't think we're here for some purpose. Um. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's interesting seeing how many people view this question from like a very like materialistic perspective versus like a lot of other people are like hyper spiritual and like magical about it. And it's like interesting to find out where those two perspectives. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, consciousness, you think, what do you think? Is it a biological phenomenon or what are your thoughts I'm about pure, it? I'm purely materialistic phenomenon. About that too. Yeah. What um, about, I just think, We've figured out some things about, it's hard to figure out, it's hard to study. We don't have a good model system for studying consciousness. We can't do experiments on people. Other organisms don't have the same consciousness as we do. If you know like the Thomas Nagel essay, what is it like to be a bat? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, like I have no idea what it's like to be a three-year-old toddler even though I live with one. Like, even though you lived as one at <laughs> one point. I lived as one at one point, yeah. 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 So without a good system for really understand and and in spite of that fact we've done we know more about consciousness and how kind of emotional states are encoded in in neurotransmitter concentrations and things like this than we did 100 years ago and i think that this will continue to increase what do you think is the role of love i think you gotta love what you're doing mm -hmm. you gotta love who you're doing it with yeah um, yeah, yeah. Do you think this is a simulation? No. Um, but I don't care so much. Um, so long as it's, uh, so long as the programmer is not changing the parameters of the simulation while it's running, because that would make doing science very difficult. Really hard, yeah. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Um, when you've found something that nobody else in the world knows, ooh, that's, that's exciting. And you very quickly forget that nobody else in the world knows this. And I, like, even before you get to publish a paper on it or something, I find that I do it and certainly my students do it. We forget how cool this is because we've already known it for six months or a year or whatever. But nobody else in the world knows this, and this is completely new. Yeah. Oh, I love that answer. It's such a good one. I believe that's the first time we've had that one on the show. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's a huge one. Discover what no one else knows. 
and then bring that forth as a gift into the world. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Wow. Thank you so much for coming this on our show. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure. It's great hanging out with you yesterday and today. Thank this you. was a lot of fun. Thank you. Good. I'm really happy to hear that. It's been so enlightening. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online on social media about quantitative mechanistic prediction in biology. Have more conversation about that and how it can augment our health, augment our society at large, and go and build the new tools that help us poke and probe at that. And check out the links in the bio below to the Carry Lab. Also check out Lucas's Twitter profile as well. Check those links out. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders in your communities and around the world that you believe in. Support simulation. Our links are below so we can continue doing cool things like coming to China for interviews. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace. That's a wrap, cool. brother. Good awesome job. Thing.